Thanks for tuning in to the 11th episode of the Oral Literature Podcast Series. Oral Literature is a public reading program held on the last Wednesday of every month at the Terrazas Branch at Austin Public Library. The podcast series functions as an additional medium for local writers to share their work. In this episode, we will hear work from Jen Knox, Alexander Vandekamp, Ellie Francis Douglas, who along with Sheila Black will be reading the Oral Lit on June 28th. Up first is Jen Knox. Jen Knox is a writing coach and Gemini Inc.'s Writers and Communications Director. Her collection of short stories, The Glass City, won the Prize Americana for Prose and will be published by Hollywood Books International in August 2017. Connect with Jen at www.jennox.com. This is Jen Knox. I'll be reading two pieces of flash fiction. Lottery Days. You told me not to play with matches that summer. So I palmed a corner store lighter. The flame reached for the tip of your blue crayon until you knocked the lighter from my hand. You wanted to color the sky, you said, and I wouldn't ruin your chance. I plodded behind, watching socks fall down the backs of your ankles. You explained that this is why we shouldn't buy socks at odd lots, which was sometimes big lots, because kids knew, feet knew, the store carried three coat styles, and mine was one. I liked the color for fall, a warm maroon. You tugged at the slightly longer sleeve. We were both coupled by winter, our hearts twisted like tree trunks. We ate cold shrimp in the living room of a one-bedroom apartment near downtown, watching Powerpuff Girls and retelling jokes. Adjusting bra straps and headbands, discussing jobs that allowed money of our own. We quantified everything those lottery days, green grapes or tiramisu. We were plump like prunes that spring, tired of snow, grown. Perhaps this is why I chose to move somewhere warm. Heart still twisted, I navigated a state that you stitched atop a heart on a pillow that I hugged like a tiny person. I told you I had a black thumb, a fun term for not understanding the relentlessness of a southern sun. You said talking to plants gives them life, not because they hear you, but because they feed on your breath. It doesn't matter why a thing works, so long as it does. I never told you that I kept a garden for you, a swell of life that you will never see. We never admitted such sentimental things, but it's here now, your garden. It thrives for you beneath the sometimes blue sky. Polygon. Branches thwack the pocked metal roof. My car windows are smashed and I sweep shards from the seat before sitting behind the wheel. Boots crunch pedals, a warning hums and I watch, dazed, as neighbors rush to close doors and cover cars with mattresses. The hail returns. Two weeks later we walk along the river with hands clasped, fingers held together like mittens. We are not cold, we are comfort. I always forget my sunglasses, and you always bring an extra pair, a ridiculous pair. Today, a red and black checkered frame, clunky readers that you position on the bridge of my nose, above my ears. They wobble as you kiss my cheek. The weather is one shitstorm after another. Hail, tornado, extreme heat, extreme wind. There was something called a fire whirl. 40 miles from Cincinnati, but the skies are perfect now. The light is more flattering, a consolation. Nature has eliminated the need for filters. We watch the river water waver as though indecisive, and you place your hand on my ass, which suffered a few small cuts from the glass bits in my car. We watch until the horizon line blurs, the clouds disperse, the cottony stuff stretches as though on a loom. We point out fences that fell and warped wood, but our flaws fade more with each pulse. 
I place the sunglasses on your head long after the sun and search for my reflection when you look down. You'll tell me that the cuts form a polygon complete with sharp corners. You'll call it phenomenal, a tattoo from the storm. And I'll feel your hand trace the shape I won't need to see. Up next is Ellie Francis Douglas. Ellie holds a BA from St. Edwards University and an MFA from Oregon State University. She is the poetry editor at Carve Magazine. Her poems have been included in the Missouri Review Online, Washington Square Review, Borderlands Texas Poetry Review, and others. She lives in San Antonio and teaches at Northwest Vista College. The first poem she will be reading was published by the Chacon Street Poets, and the second poem was published by the San Antonio Express News. You can learn more about Ellie or her work by visiting her website at elliefrancisdouglas.com. I'm Ellie Francis Douglas. I'm a San Antonio poet, and I'm going to be reading two poems um, from a collection of poems that I wrote for my dad. I wrote this, uh, this collection after uh, my dad passed away from cancer over six years ago now, and... Uh, and these poems are sort of in, written to him, chronicling my grief. So I'm going to read two of those poems today. Distance. You lifted the oxygen mask from your face to say, don't be sad too long. But my mind lingered in the hospital. Every room became that room. You, yellow and shiny as a wooden chair, materialized in the corner. Those blue eyes, invaded by fog, fixed on me. Looking into your eyes was like riding an airplane through a cloud I knew would never end. You came everywhere with me, like this. I'm going to read one more poem. And this is a poem that I feel like it's sort of its sibling poem. They just feel connected to me, but it was written many years later, probably three or four years later. It's called, At Least for a Little While. I dream that I am grocery shopping alone when I find you, wearing that blue shirt I sleep in sometimes now. We grip each other's arms and laugh. Meeting like this after years, we say, what are the odds? You walk with me and listen as I talk and push my cart. I tell you that I keep the mountain man you sculpted as a boy on my desk that I look into its eyes when my mind is a clean sink. You smile and nod. But you turn a corner just before me and are gone. I go through each aisle, calling. I ditch my cart and walk faster through those I have already checked again and again. When I think of you now, I see a breathing body. Isn't that progress? Why can't I keep you, at least in my own mind, at least for a little while? Up next is Alexandra Vandekamp. Originally from New York, Alexandra has called San Antonio her home for two years now. She is the Creative Writing Classes Program Director for Gemini Inc., a literary arts nonprofit based in San Antonio, and teaches poetry workshops there and online through the Poetry Barn. She is the author of two full-length collections of poems, the Park of Upside Down Chairs, and Kiss Hierarchy. For six years, Alexandra lived in Madrid, Spain, where she co-founded and edited the bilingual journal Terra Incognita. My name's Alexandra Vandekamp. I'm a San Antonio poet, originally from New York. Happy to be here in Texas. And I'm going to read three poems from a recent book of mine called Kiss Hierarchy, published by Rain Mountain Press. The first one's called Dear V, and I've writ wrote a series of poems, kind of epistolary poems, to letters of the alphabet. Um, and I had fun with the sounds of those letters, so you'll see that in this piece. Dear V, Dear Vellum, Dear Viceroy, Dear Vermeer, and the eerie light that can be found edging around our lives. The missing persons spilling out of our mail each night. The broken neon glow of a highway I once drove on my way to a 12-egg omelet folded into a neat blanket 
perch softly on my plate. Landscapes pile up in a life. Not India, not Africa, but Venice. It's ankle-deep waters I splashed through after a storm. Or the cloisters in Upper Manhattan. All medieval France and Spain tucked inside a verdant estate. Not far off the squeaking brakes of the MTA. Dear Venezuela, dear will I ever get out of here? A cage is a place our lungs breathe out of, each breath a missive to the sky above. I prayed hard when I was ten years old, but the evenings blurred just the same into a postcard Dutch landscape of purple and gray. Faith is known for its cornucopia of forms, an image of the virgin burned into a peasant shirt, Jesus's watery profile stamped onto a spoon, and Santa Teresa's finger saved in a glass case, the mossy softness of the bone, the ring glittering at its base. In my mother's book on world art, Botticelli's Venus rose from the waters on her pearly shell, her skin, her skin serene as an unmade bed, her vagina covered by tresses of drifting red hair. I scratched and scratched in my diaries as a child, cream-colored pages stuffed beneath my bed each night. But if you asked, I would say filmmakers have it made. They place a filter over the lens, and voila, their world is transformed into a coppery late October glow. I've often wished I could do that in a poem. Watch the stain of my intent seep into the window frames, the protagonist's arms, the hotel room's purring vents. The second poem I'm going to read, I'm a little obsessed with sleep. We spend a fair amount of our time doing it, and it's kind of a strange state that I think all of us humans sort of uh, take part in. Um, so the second poem is called The Swill of Sleep, and it's partly inspired by a quote from Jean Seberg, the 1960s actress that was in Jean-Luc Godard's great film called Breathless. And here's the quote from that film. It's sad to fall asleep. It separates people. Each body is a bouquet of mishaps, jagged with breath. When we sleep, we tip over the jar of our dreams and end up backstroking through the muck of ourselves. European airports and dark bodies falling from the sky. The subconscious and aging perfume giving off its musky odors and sweating fedoras. Darling, it's sad to be a soul philodode in skin. We breathe through the apparatus of ourselves when we wake and when we sleep. Enmeshed in scars, Aston Martins, and back lots weedy with regret, how can we ever be with anyone but ourselves? A kiss is a false conference of voices, a swerve in the day two faces briefly make a shivering bridge attempting to support the breath's weight. Don't get me wrong, I relish the martini swill of sleep in my mouth, its smoky lavenders and dusks of daggers, its sisters and fathers cursing from behind the brocade curtains. The mind is always on trial. Every decision we make a pas de deux, we dance alone across a ballroom. Sleep, darling, is a gash a giddy depth we didn't know we had. And the final poem is called Kiss Hierarchy. It's actually the title poem of my, my book. Um, and it was inspired from reading Anais Nin, her journals. And this quote is from Anais Nin, and it comes um, at the beginning of the poem, so I'll read it first. There are two ways to reach me by way of kisses or by way of the imagination. But there is a hierarchy. The kisses alone don't work. If kisses don't suffice, their caviar salt and champagne do, what would? The night inside each kiss? 
the liquid bird inside that night, the slick backs of ants sliding through the grass, the moist reluctance of time inside a kiss, the standing back and pondering the canvas of a kiss, its feast of unknowns, its drowning flowers and rose dresses, its rising barometers, or the chaise long legs of a kiss, the pale face emerging from a night garden kiss. There are green tea kisses, kisses brewed long and slow, like the heat building in trees in a Virginia June, the humid tapestry of their branches, the swerved spine of their stare. A kiss is never wrong. It knows what it is, whether it lies or tells a truth. Each kiss is a museum hung with previous kisses, a history, the Marc Chagall kiss, the view of Naples through a window kiss, windshield kiss, the let's get this over with kiss. Presumably, you could kill with a kiss. It all depends on the setting and script, on what needs to be done. A kiss is a dent into us. It leaves its gunpowder smoke and ash residue its sparrows dropping from the sky. Where does a kiss end and a scar begin? Now I'm getting all Ingrid Bergman on you, all cap burglar and stealth bomber, but no movie can tell you this. You have to kiss your way through to your own truth about a kiss. There's simply no other way to do it. It's lonely. A kiss is a darkness, a cave we fumble into and through. But I only speak from personal experience, from a wake of kisses and not kisses trailing behind me, keeping me in their own peculiar company.